Thank you very much for your company in our very first story. Ghana has experienced different events characterizing nearly 60 years as an independent country. Key among them has been military interventions and a stable democratic governance since 1992. Even before the swearing-in of the fifth president of this republic takes place, Joy News will bring you a documentary that captures all key events that have characterized our journey as a democratic state so far. Here is an excerpt from that documentary. A new African in the world. That new African is ready to fight his own battle and show that after all, the black man is capable of managing his own affairs. The famous speech that many say gave birth to the nation Ghana. Three years after independence, when Ghana became a republic, a referendum was held in April 27, 1960, first to elect the first president of the First Republic and also to approve the Republican Constitution. By 1966, it had become impossible for Nkrumah to be removed through the ballot box. There was only one way for a change. The nine-year-old nation experienced its first coup d'etat. called you here this morning for one specific reason, and that is this coup was carried out completely because of the things that had happened in Ghana. The National Liberation Council supervised another presidential and parliamentary election, which ushered the country into the Second Republic in October of 1969. Ladies and gentlemen, we present to you Dr. Kofia Prefabusia. Ghana, we now have freedom. For some, this would be the last time the military would show up in the political space. That was not to be, as General I.K. Echampong, then a Lieutenant Colonel, ousted Professor Buzia from power, despite ongoing plans for a transition from a military government to a civilian one. On May 15, 1979, a name and face that would go on to be familiar in the political space attempted a coup, but was unsuccessful. The leader of the attempted coup was put before trial. I keep describing it as turning on the gas in a kitchen. That's how volatile it was. It had been a long journey. Wabwe Jeke is president for every single Ghanaian without discrimination, malice, or ill will. Well, the incoming NPP majority in Parliament is expected to elect Professor Michael Quay as the new Speaker of Parliament, supported uh, by surprise inclusion Jose Wusso's first Deputy Speaker. Now, John News can confirm that outgoing majority leader will also be confirmed at midnight as the second Deputy Speaker for the new Parliament. Now, let me run you through other names that have come up for the new leadership of Parliament so far. So, um, Osei Chaymen Sabons, who is MP for Swami, and the current minority leader will become second, um, will become a majority leader, I beg your pardon, in the new Parliament. Harune Drisu, who is MP for Tamale South, and Minister of Employment and Labor Relations, will become the minority leader in the next Parliament. Adwa Safo, who is MP for Domi Kwameja, becomes a deputy uh, majority leader in, in the seventh parliament. James Avedi, MP for Ho, who is a chair of the finance committee in parliament, becomes the deputy minority speaker. And uh, Ameao Treme, MP for Sunyani East, becomes the majority chief whip. And Mubarak uh, Muntaka, MP for Sarase, and the current uh, majority chief whip in par parliament becomes the minority chief whip in the next parliament. Uh, 
And Executive Director of the Center for Parliamentary Affairs, Rashid Dramani, has been sharing some thoughts on the selection so far uh, for the new leadership of the incoming parliament with my colleague, Mamavi Ousu Abwaje. I think MPP has to be commended for um, the inclusive nature of, of that appointment, making sure that, uh, I mean, it's not only gender, but I think uh, the voice of young people and so on reflected in, in the leadership of our um, legislative. Is that how you describe the, uh, you know, the position of Adjoa Safo in terms of what went into the thinking? Well, I mean, I'm just her. guessing. Okay. And I'm praising the, the party for making sure that uh, at least uh, there is some representation. It's not just an all men affair. Okay. I mean, that's, that's uh, the point I'm trying to make. If you compare that to the other side, the incoming minority, I think it's an all men affair. Um, the two gentlemen um, both have uh, never been in, I mean, real leadership as compared to, for instance, uh, They've been on the front bench, um, but not, I mean, uh, uh, leadership as, uh, as is the case of Honorable Jose Chim and Sabunsu. Um, but they bring a combination um, of skills and talents that I believe Ghanaians will be looking very much forward to in terms of uh, ensuring that one of the most important um, roles of any legislature um, is to keep an eye on the national purse, to ensure that um, citizens have value for every bit of their resources. Yeah. And, and I see in the appointment of uh, um, Honorable Abeji, having been chairman of the finance committee um, for many years with his background as an accountant and so on, I see and I hope that um, we'll get the kind of scrutiny that uh, we'll need in terms of um, loan agreements, in terms of budget, uh, in terms of um, ensuring that the minority performs the function of keeping the majority on its toes in a constructive manner, in a manner that, is, uh, that, that shows loyalty to the Ghanaian cause and not loyalty to the NDC cause um, in a manner that um, would not be uh, that they are just opposing because they want to snatch votes from the majority come the next election, mm. but that they are providing the much needed constructive criticism that uh, would advance the Ghana project. Okay. Well, MP for Bama Central and uh, I am um, Theophilus Tete Chai has been sharing his thoughts also with Mama V. Uso Obwaje. I'm, I'm very satisfied in the work we've done over the period. And for me, that is what I'm taking out of okay. this house. Because that is what I can use as an individual. Mm. Okay. As a yardstick for my work over the years. Okay. The issues of infrastructure has been a bay to the development of this country. And for me, I've always said that, look, per our population structure, we, should, we have to match development with our population growth. That's the only way we can reduce poverty. So any legislation, anything that will enhance expanding the economy of this country, I'm all for it. Okay. And myself, my colleagues, we've worked very, very hard to ensure that um, uh, the expansion of infrastructure in this country mm. is enhanced. And no one, over the last uh, four years, we've had phenomenal expansion of infrastructure mm. in this country. What, what would you miss about you? And uh, my disappointment uh, will be the right to information bill. Okay. Seriously speaking. You, 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 you failed us. Yes, we've all failed. 
No, don't say we for your majority. You could have done this. No. You could have even done this two months no, ago, three no, months ago, no, no, six no, no, no. months ago. No, 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 no. Why not? You see, this bill has been a bill that has involved a lot of stakeholder consultation because everybody wants to ensure that we get it right mm. so that it will not be a law that will be on our books and then at the end of the day it becomes very difficult to implement my colleague he's been very very hard working on that bill anytime it comes to the legislative work he's there mm. And but bottom line, the, you failed us. No, you yeah, see, you failed us. what we have done so now, we, you see, what we have done now, rather fine-tune the bill. Because look, the first time it came into parliament, it was... Mm. <laughs> so the, the loopholes were too many, okay? It was fine-tuned, and currently it has also gone through some fine tuning. Mm. So the next government will have it very easy. Okay. All right. Very, very easy. <laughs> and for me, that is the happiness that we will derive from. Okay, this so right what would you miss uh, about, about yourself being in this parliament? Well, um, missing, for me, uh, I don't know. Really? Because, yeah, because I've, I've, I've planned my exit okay. over, over four you, years friends? now. Friends? You didn't make yes. any tight friends? Oh, for, for <laughs> friends, for friends, we, we will still be friends. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. Dear Flesset, the tie there, ending that interview with Mama Vion, how he'll miss Parliament. It's now time to hear from Joe Saewusu, who is MP for Bekwai and the incoming first Deputy Speaker of Parliament on his thoughts on the new leadership for the House. Conflict between the expectations of your constituents and your constitutional responsibility. Mm. It's a very fine and a delicate mm. balance. I have been advocating that there are one of two things we must do. Mm. Either you make the MP, in addition to be a, being a lawmaker, also the development agent, or you make the people elect the development agent on the ground, that is the M MMCs. Mm. That is the only way the people take note of his or her responsibility because they don't go to them to ask for their votes. They don't feel that they owe them any duty of care because we go around and ask for their votes. And sometimes you make promises as well. Of course, yes. We promise that we, uh, when our party is in government, we will do the things they expect us to do. Uh, and I think a major misunderstanding of what is the MP's share of what the common fund is also a major challenge. If you don't interact with your people frequently, other people misinform them. Mm. And so, I, well, over the years, what I do, at least once a year, I go around all the communities that constitute my constituency, 116 of them. The why? Yes, and I let them know that this is all I have, and this is how I'm sharing it. You have asked for this. You will not get this this time because that community is getting a little part of that money. The next one that comes, you're getting your share. Mm. But they don't, I'm surprised that they don't ask of the same thing. They don't ask with confidence from the MC. Mm. They think that the MC is doing them a favor. Why do they think that you, you owe them a duty? Because they voted for you. And, and that's why the reason they're voting for you is often lost on them that they are voting you to become, and they even complain that you've gone to live in Accra. Mm. Meanwhile, the work they voted you You're living you big. <laughs> <laughs> that is the worst part. Uh, because of the big vehicles. <laughs> you know, they think you're living big, when in fact you're poorer. But I think we, we must work out resolving that conflict. I, I thought it was a Ghanaian problem. I'm happy to know that it, it, it's, it's global in the sense that there's a, a major failure of local governance. Local governance in our system is, is failing. And for that reason, the only person they know is the one they voted for. Mm. Now, if you are going to reverse the trend, you should vote for people who are in charge of local governance, or you should make the people they vote for the development agent so they can hold them accountable. Okay. So that was Joe Sewusu, MP for Bekwine, incoming first deputy speaker. 
uh, of Parliament. He was speaking on local governance and not on his thoughts on the new leadership. You're watching Joy News today with me, Benis Abubed. We'll be back with more stories. Please stay with us. Thank you so much for staying here on Joe News today. Now, Parliament is finalizing pending businesses of the House prior to its dissolution at midnight tonight. And let's take you live to the floor for the latest. My colleague Joseph Opukugaku joins us on the telephone lines with more. Hello, Joseph. Bennett, good afternoon to you. Good afternoon. What happened on the floor of Parliament this morning? And so over the last 45 minutes or so, the speaker... Uh, has been speaking on the floor, and so has the majority leader, Alban Babin, and the minority leader, Osei and Sabonti. They've been giving what they call the closing remarks ahead of the eventual dissolution of the House later today. And so the minority leader, Osei Tiemen Sabonti, has, for example, been making the point that over the last four years, Parliament has made a number of moves by way of motions on the floor of the House to help ensure that transparency becomes the order of the day. But the majority has repeatedly used its numbers to thwart some of those efforts to ensure transparency in the administration of government, the efforts to deepen the fight against corruption. Mm -hmm. And he thinks uh, that is not uh, something that actually went on well. That should change going into the next parliament. He's also been expressing concern about the high attrition rate in the House, He's been explaining that in Parliament, for example, when you look at the House, which session is ending currently, they had more than 130 members. When they started back in 2013, about 60 of them were new. But things have changed. Looking at the next Parliament that's beginning, the sessions from tomorrow, they have the, actually the, the minority, the upcoming majority side has 169 members. But only 80 of them are continuing, and more than 89 of them are new people who are coming into the House. And you think that this would not help the quality of work that will be delivered in the end. The majority that has also been speaking on the floor of the House. He's been expressing concern about the kind of security that members of Parliament have received over the years. He made reference to the killing of the late J.B. Dankwe Edu, the former member of Parliament for Bwaka North, and makes the point that it's as a result of the lack in security that led to his death and his shooting. And so that should change with the next Parliament. He's also been expressing concern about the inability of the House to pass a number of bills, including the right to information bill. And mm. he goes on to insist that that is not the only bill that the House couldn't pass. And it's not as if they don't exactly prioritize that bill. That's how come it didn't get passed. But there are a number of others, including the Plan Bidders bill, which did not get passed during the tenure of this particular parliament. And his expectation is that going into the next parliament, the House will prioritize those specific bills and get them passed. So right. the closing remarks are still ongoing on the floor, and then the speaker will give his final address to the House. All right, we'll come back to you for more details in subsequent bulletins. Thank you very much. That's my colleague, uh, Joseph Opoku Gapu. Now, President-elect Nana Kofuado and Dr. Baumia have both maneuvered a lot of pitfalls in their lives, and especially in their journey to the Flagstaff House. For Dr. Baumia, it has been a steady rise from the shadows of obscurity through the corridors of economic and financial management to the harsh Ghanaian political terrain. But for Ekufuado, his umbilical cord is literally buried in the birth of Ghana's independence struggle, with three of his family members, part of the Big Six, Seth Kwame Boating and Kweku Wusu Pipra, have been exploring the unknown details of their lives in two special documentaries. Here are excerpts. <laughs> This is the house that uh, Dr. Baumier lived when he was uh, in Damascus. He was here as a prophet. Alhaji Awal has brought me to the dormitory where Dr. Baumier lived while at the Tamale Secondary School. The building has been recently renovated, as Alhaji Awal tells me. Because Dr. Baumier was so good in class as a, an economist, we call his school well Bank. From friends to teachers, the testimony about Ghana's vice president is that he's a smart man. Dr. Baumia's headmaster then, Alhaji Rahim Bedamoshi. He took everything through easily and, uh, you know, he was just, he was good. 
In addition to that, he was, uh, he was very active in uh, co-curricular activities. I remember going to the carpenter to ask him to, to, to get a bat for me. So they, they, they showed him what it looked like and he measured it and, and, and cut it out of wood. You know, and so we were doing this kunka kunka thing across my mom's dining table <laughs> whenever they were not <laughs> in the living room. So we, we, we used to have our table tennis games of that. So, you know, I learned the game the hard way. And Dr. Baumia married Samira, the lifestyle TV presenter and daughter of the former national chairman of the People's National Convention, Alhaji Ahmed Ramadan. When you meet the one you know, when you meet the person you're supposed to marry, you know, the man for me. What's attracted you to him? Oh, so many things. He's intelligent, he's, he's, he's kind, he's honest, he's, yeah, so many things about him. Nana Adudankwa Ekufu Ado has been a political actor for more than 40 years. But before that, this 73-year-old man was encouraged by his father to grasp the knowledge of the world by reading. When we were all uh, out also and allowed to go and play, Ronaldo was made to read and read and read. My father actually made him read so much. He says he doesn't mind if it's com comics. He says he should read trash. He should read serious books. He should read everything. He started his primary education at the Government Boys School in Adabraka and later at the Row Road School, now Kimbu, both in Accra Central. A lawyer and if you want to be a hospital, Swalaba or baby. I was born in Swalaba. My father had moved to Betty House at the time when all the big events took place. So 1948 was some of my very first memories. They coincided or they, uh, they were made by the 28th February riots. Mm -hmm. Um, it took place just before I was four years old. Wow, yes. And I remember that was like a turning point in my life because there were so many people who were coming in out of the house, my father, Grandpa Dankwa, Uncle Chemi, all of them moving around, going out, coming in. And I knew something really dramatic had occurred. Uh, so those uh, two documentaries air today on this channel at 6. And uh, let's go to the Black Star Square now. My colleague Jennifer Ekwamwa is there monitoring uh, things on the ground. And that's the venue for tomorrow's inauguration where President-elect Nanado Dankwe Kufado will be sworn into office. Hello, Jennifer. Jennifer, if you can hear me, just bring us up to speed with what's happening on the ground at the Black Star Square. Hi, Venice. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Jennifer. All right, most definitely. Well, earlier I informed you of how the police are forming ranks, and I've been joined by Dr. Agozo, who is the director of operations here, I mean, at the police force. He's going to bring us up to speed with exactly what the police will be doing tomorrow as part of the security detail during the inauguration. Doctor, good afternoon. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. So can you kindly tell us uh, what exactly is, will the role of the police be tomorrow during the inauguration? We understand that national security is taking the lead, but the police and military are also playing roles. So can you give us some background on what the police will be doing specifically? Thank you one more time. Um, generally, police are here to keep law and order. We'll be mining all the gates. We'll be ensuring that those who do not have invitations and accreditation, as has been explained already, enter. We'll be ensuring that um, all the stands are well manned and protected and ensure as well that 
cars are well parked. Um, we have some parking lots, and if you don't have red um, accreditation or green green card or uh, yellow card or blue card, green, blue or red card, you don't enter with your vehicle. All these things are part of the plans that we have in place, and we will also be assisting in um, screening people. Of course, even if you have accreditation, you have to be screened before you enter the 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 the, the, the Independence uh, Square. So these are basically some of the things that we'll be doing. And how many policemen and women exactly are you expecting to undertake this activity tomorrow? Um, we are expecting to use over 3,000 police personnel. You see, this is a big place and a large place. We are talking about even traffic control in and around this area from um, uh, Castle, uh, Castle Junction over there and then from the uh, Starless 95 traffic light over there and also from the SEPS um, traffic light over there. And so people are going to man all these places. We are also going to line up in such a way because, you see, once there's not going to be accreditation, we anticipate, once people are going to come here by invitation, we anticipate that crowd and other people may come around trying to force themselves in or other way around. So we will have our SWAT teams, we will have our RDA rapid response unit people over here, and we will have policemen manning the place at all strategic locations and also ensuring the security of the vehicles that are parked around here so that we don't live here with people's um, uh, vehicles having been boggled or other way around. But with, with less than 24 hours till the big day, shouldn't the issue of accreditation have been resolved by now? Well, I don't want to go there. Um, the planning committee is responsible for that. I mean, the grounds committee and some other committees are responsible for that. But remember, this is a huge event. This is a very huge event, and the dynamics are so many. And therefore, at each point in time, certain decisions have to be made depending on the, uh, 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 the circumstances. And therefore, I, I, I think that they have even, it's even made our work, work very easy or easier because without accreditation, you are not coming in. And once you are not coming in without accreditation, it makes the work of the police easy. And therefore, the public out there should hear this loud and clear that if you, are, you intend coming into an uh, independent square tomorrow, without accreditation, then please rethink, because there are other giant screens at the stadium, in the regions, in the districts that have been provided for supporters and Ghanaians in general to watch the event, so that this event will go live and also be orderly. Thank you very much. And that's the director of, of operations at the police force, uh, Dr. Agozo. And I'm still here at the Independence Square reporting live. The police force is here getting ready, forming ranks for tomorrow's big events. They have all been deployed to various sections of the Independence Square. Am I right, doctor? Right. We have um, already deployed them. This is a rehearsal for us today, the final rehearsal, where people are posted to places where they, uh, they are expected to be seen tomorrow. So in all, we have a large number of people here, even to the front out there, and even to um, the conference center everywhere within and around here. Because you see, people are going to park their vehicles at the conference center and then be bused to this place. The protection of their vehicles is also important. The building is also very important. And don't also forget, the duties have already started. Today we have dissolution of parliament. Police must be there, and that dovetails into tomorrow. And it's a continuation of this, uh, I mean, of that event that comes here. So pa uh, Parliament will reconvene here. And so it's, it's, it's a, a lot of work for police this time. But I believe that with a large number of people, even from the regions, and don't forget also that even as we continue this work here, other traditional police duties in town must continue. People must be in the charge office at the banks and other places. And that's the reason why we brought help from the regions. So far we brought almost 800 people police personnel from other regions to come and support us and that's why you see the numbers very large here. Yeah, so expecting uh, slightly over 3,000 police personnel to be in full force tomorrow during the inauguration right here at the Independence Square and other vantage points uh, throughout the city and near the venue. Thank you so much for your time, Dr. Algozo. Uh, we are very, very grateful. So this is, uh, you're still watching uh, Joy News today. and We're reporting live from the Independence Square. Preparations far advanced. The police forming ranks and uh, getting prepared really for the deployment exercises that they'll be doing you know tomorrow and also today as they are going to be uh, 
uh, protecting all the, the, uh, the VIPs, the important dignitaries, and uh, all the many other important uh, personalities who will be attending the inauguration. I don't know if you can see behind me. Also, there's been a lot of development here at the Independence Square. All the structures are coming up very nicely. More and more people coming around to speak to the police force to find out what exactly is going on and also to confirm their accreditation for tomorrow. As has been reported, uh, people who do not have the necessary accreditation will not be allowed into the actual square and they're all being encouraged to go and watch from the across sports stadium or from the comfort of their homes. Bernice. Thank you very much, Jennifer, a woman on the ground at the Black Star Square, where tomorrow's inauguration ceremony will take place. You're watching Joe News today.